Well, welcome everyone to another lecture in the series Perspectives on Economic Liberty, hosted by the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty here at Arizona State University. I'm Ross Emmett, the director of the Center and Professor of Economic Thought in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. The Perspectives Lecture Series emerges from the Center's mission, which is to evaluate the contribution of economic liberty to human betterment. We undertake a variety of programs in economic thought and economic policy. Our Doing Business North America report measures the ease of doing business in 130 cities across Canada, the US and Mexico. We also participate in research programs and run conferences in the history and philosophy of economics and issues related to voluntary governance. The center will provide support for a brand new certificate program that ASU uh, will be hosting starting in the 2021-2022 academic year. That certificate program is in philosophy, politics, and economics. One of the ways that we fulfill our mission is to invite a variety of guests who interrogate our center's topics by revisiting past debates over the role of economic liberty or evaluating economic liberty's contribution to human betterment for good or ill, and consider its relation to other human values and freedoms that we may hold. The lecture today will highlight the question of what liberalism today can contribute to human betterment. Our guest is Dr. Emily Shamley Wright. She is the president and chief executive officer of the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University with offices in Arlington in Virginia. When I asked her to speak for us, she asked if she could use the lecture to work out some thoughts she had on the on deeply challenging aspects of liberalism. What makes it hard to carry on the tradition forward in today's environment? Of course, I, I said that'd be great. So uh, we look forward to her talk. Dr. Shanley Wright is eminently prepared to address these questions, educated at George Mason University from which she holds a PhD in economics. She has served two other institutions of higher education before joining the Institute for Humane Studies. She was a professor of economics at Beloit College where she and I first uh, interacted, although not in person, um, via email and uh, other things where she founded, uh, at Beloit, she founded the Miller Upton Program on the Wealth and Well-Being of Nations, and she served as an Associate Dean. During her Beloit years, she joined and led the research team seeking to think about the challenges facing New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina through the work of the Austrian tradition of economics and the work of Eleanor Ostrom. That led to the publication of the Cultural and Political Economy of Recovery, Social Learning in a Post-Disaster Environment. During that period, she was invited to be Provost and Dean of Washington College across the Chesapeake Bay from Washington, DC, and subsequently assumed the presidency of the Institute for Humane Studies, which supports and partners with professors to promote and research the ideas of classical liberalism and advance higher ed's purpose of intellectual discovery and human progress. Thank you, Emily, for joining us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you now. Thank you so much, Ross. I really appreciate it, and a lovely introduction, and we're so appreciative at IHS, at the Institute for Humane Studies, uh, for all the work that you do at the center, and you do with your colleagues at, at, at uh, Arizona State University, and all, the, all that you do to support a free society. So thank you for that. Now, as the, as the title of my talk suggests, this evening I'll be talking a lot about liberalism and that's a word that gets used in different ways. So I wanna begin with a definition. The liberalism I'm referring to is the philosophical, moral and political system that begins with the default presumption that we human beings, all of us, are one another's dignified equals. From this starting point follows other liberal principles such as individual liberty, equal rights, the rule of law, toleration, intellectual openness, and pluralism. 
Economic historian Deirdre McCloskey observes that liberalism is the mother of the 3,000% increase in material abundance the world has experienced over the last two and a half centuries. Because liberalism acknowledged the dignity of the common person and it tapped humanity's creativity, ingenuity, and productive capacity. And that ushered in dramatically improved conditions, longer lifespan, longer lifespans and more elbow room for economic, scientific, and cultural experimentation. While liberalism in practice has never fully lived up to its ideals, it's those ideals that have guided us toward greater freedom and greater equality over time. Now, given all this, we have good reason then to, for concern that illiberalism is on the rise globally and here at home. Countries once thought, uh, once thought to be on a clear path toward stable liberal democracy, like Poland and Hungary, for example, have taken a hard right turn toward blood and soil nationalism. Today, the American public is still reeling from the January 6th storming of the US Capitol. While Americans have long been aware of the troubling presence of far-right extremism, conventional wisdom held that it was too fringe to impact mainline 21st century political culture. But clearly, conventional wisdom was wrong. Now, liberalism faces challenges not only in politics and not only from far-right populism, but in mainstream academic and public discourse as well. Scholars and public intellectuals on both the left and the right have declared liberalism a failed project. Critics on the nationalist right reject liberalism's openness to the world and its embrace of cultural change, calling instead for economic nationalism and closed borders. Critics on the progressive left reject liberalism's openness to the free exchange of ideas. Liberal guarantees of equality, they argue, will not suffice if we are to attend to pressing social justice concerns. Political and economic systems, they argue, must be wholly reimagined and re-engineered to ensure equal outcomes. Now, not so long ago, around about 1989 or so with the fall of the Berlin Wall, liberalism didn't seem to need vocal defenders. Liberal democracy was the presumed default of what good looked like. Whatever disagreements we might have had regarding tax policy or economic regulation, liberalism was the common ground on which most of us stood. Given the challenges I've just described though, that common ground can no longer be assumed. What then is required of us if we are to reconstruct and reclaim the liberal project of universal human dignity, civil liberties, constrained government, the rule of law, toleration, pluralism, and intellectual and economic openness? I'm going to jump to the end here so you can see where I'm heading. The argument I have in mind, and it is definitely a work in progress, and that's why I'm really looking forward to the Q&A part of this, because I think you can help me take the project in the direction it needs to go. Here's my, here's my, what I have, the argument that I have in mind. Reconstructing the liberal project will require the development of a civic code that transcends public policy conversations. Such a code would be in part cultural, including liberal norms, intuitions, and sensibilities, and in part intellectual, such that when those norms and intuitions are subjected to scrutiny, they can stand up in the face of reasonable interrogation. So that's where I'm heading, but let me pull back a little bit, take a step back and sketch out why, on the one hand, it should be easy for us to make the case for liberalism and why nonetheless living in the liberal society is a challenge. Making the case for liberalism should be easy for starters because liberalism makes it easy to be productive. In the extended liberal order, it's like we're in a cooperation ecosystem that makes each of us more productive. I know literally nothing about computer engineering, but because that knowledge is embedded within the design circuitry and software of my laptop, it's as if I possess that knowledge and I'm wildly more productive as a result. Now, liberalism coaxes all this productive ease through voluntary exchange. Voluntary action is plain and simple easier than predatory action. And while it may seem easy to take someone else's stuff, once you do, you've created enemies. 
You'll need to watch your back, fortify your defenses and so on. Because it promotes peaceful interaction and exchange, liberalism relieves us from a great deal of this burden. Liberalism's openness makes learning easy as well, or at least a little bit easier because it invites intellectual exchange that course corrects, eliminates error and fosters discovery. Now, perhaps most importantly, liberalism makes it easier to live among one another. The liberal principle of religious toleration was born out of the bloody religious conflicts that followed the Reformation period. Toleration was the alternative to killing one another. But for all these forms of ease, liberalism is also deeply challenging, politically, intellectually, psychologically, and culturally challenging. Achieving the liberal democratic order is anything but inevitable. As political economists uh, Douglas North, John Wallace, and Barry Weingast observe, before they will usher in liberal rules of governance, the existing political elite must see it in their interest to do so. It's the rare moments in history when those incentives align. Once achieved, liberalism is politically difficult to maintain as special interests work to align with political power to tip the scales in their favor, eroding the liberal principles of neutral procedures and equality before the law. Liberalism is intellectually challenging. The mechanisms by which the liberal order operates are not always obvious. The lesson, for example, that good intentions do not always result in good outcomes is a difficult one to learn. Liberalism is emotionally and psychologically challenging. It takes a particular psychological demeanor to face economic uncertainty and cultural disruption with a spirit of forbearance. And then there's the raw fact that we are still working on it. The liberal project is far from complete and the patience required is in tension with liberal ideals. What is both promising and frustrating about liberalism is that it is more process than end state. As if on a journey where the destination is imaginable but not yet experienced, liberal principles act like a compass pointing us in the right direction. If I'm right that liberalism is hard in all these respects, that makes the challenge of overcoming illiberalisms on the left and the right daunting. Liberals, left of center liberals, classical liberals, the small government conservative liberals, need to be thinking through how we can overcome these challenges. Now, clearly reclaiming the liberal project will be in part about public policy, but liberalism cannot be reclaimed through policy alone. Reconstructing the liberal project will be both a cultural and an intellectual enterprise. It's a cultural endeavor because the institutions essential to the liberal order rely upon the norms, practices, and transmission mechanisms of culture. As the 18th century moral philosopher Adam Smith understood, for example, the effective administration of justice relies upon common moral sentiments about what constitutes just conduct. The, the 20th century economist F.A. Hayek argued that the rules that make the expanse of the market order possible such as property rights and the rules of contract are not developed through instrumental reason, but are instead inherited culturally, often without a clear understanding of why the inherited practices convey the benefits that they do. It is not the police car on the corner or the cold calculus of cost and benefit that leads most people most of the time to conduct their affairs honestly and with integrity. It is the internalized sensibility that removes predatory behavior from the menu of options in the first place. In her Bourgeois Virtues trilogy, McCloskey argues that the great enrichment the world has experienced since the start of the Industrial Rev Revolution depends not only on economic reasoning, but on the virtues of love, hope, faith, courage, temperance, and justice. A shift in the ideas attributing dignity to the merchant and manufacturer, she argues, were the principle, was the principal source of the growth that shaped the modern world and enriched its inhabitants. In a similar vein, my George Mason University colleague Peter Betke argues that reclaiming the liberal project will require that we not only pursue good public policy, 
we must also cultivate what he describes as mature moral intuitions so that good policies make intuitive sense to the public. So Smith, Hayek, McCloskey, Betke, and other liberal thinkers are right, I believe, to focus on moral sentiments, intuitions, norms, and bourgeois attitudes, because it's in this realm of human thought where our behavior becomes, through generations of enculturation, automatic. Once an argument is internalized within a culture, the impulse to do the right thing bypasses the need for deliberation. Because they work regardless of whether or not people understand why they work, sentiments, intuitions, norms, habits, and attitudes create a scale effect for the institutions they support. When moral sensibilities have been so internalized that we follow them without thinking, external monitoring, policing, becomes less necessary, thereby lowering the costs of rule enforcement. As the costs of rule enforcement drop, the benefits of rule following become more widespread. We get more peaceful trade and less predatory behavior. Liberal intuitions, in other words, help liberal institutions take root and thrive. But there is a downside. When the right response, the just and honorable response, the peacemaking response, no longer requires deliberation, we don't deliberate. And without deliberation, we can more easily forget why those liberal impulses tended to draw, tended to lead us to good outcomes. I'll come to this, back to this point in a second. Now, arguably, among the moral intuitions, most important to the liberal project is that, is what I will call the default optimism in the face of change. This optimism can manifest itself in a variety of ways, such as an attitude of calm and curiosity in the midst of cultural and economic disruption. If we see the world through this lens, our default is to believe that social, cultural, and economic processes have a way of working out, even though we don't know exactly how they, they, they will work out in advance. In the face of rapid change, liberalism's critics from both the left and the right challenge such optimism. Economic nationalists, for example, argue that economic dynamism has left the American economy vulnerable to the whims of foreign powers and the American worker without meaningful and dignified work. Global supply chains must be reshored, they argue, and, econ and American industry coordinated through trade restrictions and national industrial policy. Scholars and public intellectuals in these, cir uh, in these circles often argue further that immigration must be restricted in a manner that preserves, quote unquote, American cultural culture and identity. Religious conservatives within these circles eschew what they describe as the corrosive effects of liberalism on the American family. Arguing that liberalism has failed communities, they call instead for a return to localism and traditional family structures. Now Hayek anticipated challenges like these, Though we live in an extended, open, globally connected world, each of us still has one, one foot in the intimate sphere of the small tribal band. Family, neighborhood, faith-based communities are contexts in which local knowledge is rich and traditional lines of authority still exert influence. Liberalism pushes against powerful instincts deeply embedded within the human psyche that drive us toward the unfamiliar, that drive us toward the familiar, the parochial, and settled patterns of authority. In the liberal order, change is part of the package. Critics of liberalism see the disruption of, of economic and cultural dynamism, but they don't see the order that emerges in its wake. They view disruption as a bug in the system, not as an essential feature of a dynamic adaptive process. In moments of disarray, we instinctively want to deploy our faculties of reason and design to bring about order out of chaos or what we perceive to be chaos. But this is where we get ourselves into trouble. When we apply the principles of design, control, and top-down authority to the extended order of the open society, we crush it. The instinctive impulse to impose order from the top down presents a serious challenge to the liberal project. 
progressive and nationalist conservative platforms seeking aggressive state control over industry are appealing to anyone who believes that top-down control is the only principle by which order can return. Such policies tend to go unchallenged because the self-regulating properties of complex social systems are difficult to comprehend through direct experience alone. As Hayek famously observed, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. Now Hayek is not saying that men who think they can design complex social processes are stupid. He's saying that the paradigm that order the, that the paradigm that order is the outcome of deliberate arrangement, that's stubbornly sticky because the intuitions that come that work in one sphere, the intimate order of the familial tribal society, are more accessible to us. They're more obvious, intuitive to us. If you're operating within the paradigm of that simple order, it seems absurd to use Hayek's word that a decentralized bottom up process will outperform top down authority in, the, in a complex society. It is precisely for problems like these that the reconstruction of the liberal project cannot, cannot be based on intuition, sensibility and culture alone. A cultural imp impulse toward optimism in the face of disruption is too easily worn away if it does not have intellectual grounding. If the public does not understand what's at stake. Scholars, teachers, writers, and public intellectuals play an important role in the reconstruction project because they articulate and transmit the mental models that anticipate the emergence of order and coordination out of disruption. They help us see international competition new arrivals from distant places and disruptive innovation as opportunities for mutual benefit and human progress. But these lessons aren't obvious. In order to stick and resist the slide back toward top-down authoritarian control, cultural intuitions that lean toward freedom need intellectual grounding. A default optimism in the face of change is but one liberal norm that requires intellectual reinforcement. Other liberal norms that challenge our familial intimate order instincts and benefit from intellectual uh, grounding include toleration, intellectual openness, and the principle of neutrality in the administration of justice. What I'm describing here is the development of a civic code. And what I have in mind is similar to, the public, to what the public intellectual of the last century, Walter Lippmann, described as a public philosophy. And what sociologists Robert Bella and Philip Hammond call a civil religion. Now, I prefer the phrase civic code because it connotes a pathway between faith or religion on the one hand and full on reason, philosophy on the other. A liberal civic code would embrace and assert instinctively its highest ideals that we are one another's dignified equals that each of us is equal before the law, that the good society is one in which pluralism and mutual respect thrive, and that these commitments define what it means to be a good neighbor, a good parent, a good colleague, and a good citizen. But if pressed, such impulses, if we have this code, such impulses could withstand the scrutiny of interrogation. We could, if called upon to do so, explain the intuition behind the code to our neighbors, to our children, to our colleagues and fellow citizens. And we would feel it our duty to do so. Now, how these two parts of the civic code, the cultural part and the intellectual and the intellectual part interact with one another, that's still under theorized. You know, how, how do they reinforce with one another or how might they even undermine one another? These are questions I need to think about more and to unpack. And so you're the first audience that I presented this to. And I'm hoping that you can help me move this project forward by engaging in a conversation with me about what the civic code might look like and what is required if it is to be effective. So again, thank you, Ross, for giving me this opportunity to connect with uh, uh, this, uh, this fine group. And I look forward to your questions and the conversation. Thank you very much, Emily. 
I appreciate the comments and the call for um, a, a specific action. As I was uh, listening to you, I kept writing down the words for questions. And every time I wrote something, you then took my words and said, when well, I have that question too, so I look forward to talking to you about it. And then, so I've ended up with um, just asking you perhaps, would you identify um, sort of, let's say three, but if you make it one or two, I'm fine with it. Um, things that you might want to put at the top of that code, uh, just as exploratory, um, you know, like what would, we're familiar with codes, right? We're, we're familiar with, but they sometimes sound like commandments um, or um, uh, the, you know, the code of conduct. That, um, that, that we as liberals often resist. So uh, how, what, what would be your sort of top picks? Don't give me the whole list, give me, let, let other people flesh in more. Absolutely, absolutely. But, I mean, you know, the, the Bill of Rights is a good, is a pretty good starting place, right? Um, so, so uh, you know, we, we can start there with a deep understanding of, of, um, of uh, what the First Amendment um, uh, tells us with respect to the freedoms of speech and and um, uh, and freedom of religion and and assembly, et cetera. So, so those are those are some things that would be a part of it. But unpacking the code aspect of it, it wouldn't just be um, a, an ability to recite what the First Amendment is. It would be an impulse. It would be an instinct to say. Um, two things. One is that I have the, the freedom of speech and the freedom of association, for example, that that would feel instinctive, um, but also that it would check me when I don't, when I hear something I don't like, that it would check me if my, if my impulse was to do anything other than to um, have a sense of forbearance and, and tolerate speech I didn't like, that that would check me, right? Um, that it wouldn't just be, oh, gosh darn it, you know, I, I've looked at the rule book and it turns out that I can't um, use violence against Ross because he said something um, that I don't like. It's, it's that that would be a kind of both an instinctual response on my part. And also I would understand that in the really hard cases, I could still explain to someone who didn't have that impulse why it's an important thing to uh, respect, that co respect the code. Yeah, and for as I listen to you say that, I, I you know, I, I keep going back to a standard line, which is respect for others, uh, respecting another as equal to yourself, um, and um, that seems to be part of actually the underlying message that's being destroyed is that um, some people's voices aren't worth being heard or capable of being heard or we don't want to hear them. And, and the, 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 the goal is to leap in and shut them down before they have the chance to speak. But uh, that's the underlying principle of respect for others, um, which you mentioned um, several times, it, it remains sort of a core uh, theme behind the code, right? That's right, and and we can't expect. Um, there's there's an old saying that you can't write the perfect contract. You know that that it's it's impossible to write the perfect contract. That there's always a spirit to the uh, norms that uh, lay behind the words, and so um, I think we make a mistake if we say that um, uh, the First Amendment First Amendment principles are all we need to have good, productive um, civil discourse. I think that's a big mistake, and this and it and it points us in the direction of what a code would look like. I do think that there is a necessary um, requirement, which we need freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Um, that that's a necessary um, ingredient, but it's not sufficient to have good conversations. Um, to have good conversations, we also have to have that default respect as you were just describing. We have to um, be willing to enter into our conversations with a sense of humility um, and not just a demand that we give, we be given you know, airtime. So you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into the making of a good conversation. And I, I think many of those sorts of things could be part of, the, of this, of this um, uh, civic code that I'm describing that allows us to not 
merely have a baseline set of rules that keep us from punching each other in the nose, but actually leads to productive intellectual exchange, progress on difficult and challenging problems, where we've got lots and lots of experience of working things out um, in, a, in a civil way, because the, the, it's not only the rules are operating, but also the norms are operating that says, okay, we've got a problem to solve here, Ross. The first step that we should be taking is hearing each other out. Thank you. We have now a number of questions in the queue, so I can turn to others for their questions. Um, Nancy Peets um, says that what she takes from your conversation perhaps is the importance of educational civics taught at an early age. Um, and she wonders about your uh, response to that, um, especially because it seems that um, in connection with race in America, um, the mutual respect idea that we've just been talking about may be challenged um, in the context of the educational civics, especially thinking about uh, race issues currently. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more that of how important uh, civics education is. And um, and and, and this, is, this is not my typical space because you know, I think about colleges and universities as my, as my uh, terrain, um, but I'm, I, I look at the work of say the Bill of Rights Institute does in um, the K-12 space. And I think of that as being uh, what good looks like uh, with a deep understanding of um, civics education, of understand, a deep understanding of what the um, principles are that are required for a robust citizenry and civil society. And I, I am particularly um, enamored with their work precisely because they, they say, you know, let's look at um, issues around social justice concerns, around tensions with regard to race and racism in society, and, and, and look at all of those problems through the lens of the Bill of Rights and see how far that gets us. There may, and the, what generates are, what is generated are really good conversations, right? It, it's not to suggest that we know what all of the answers are, but if you view those kinds of concerns through the lens of the Bill of Rights, it's, it's astonishing how far that can get you, that when we failed, in some, in some important respect, oftentimes it's because we failed to live up to those principles. When we failed, um, and we surely have failed, it's because we have failed to live up to the principles articulated in the De Declaration of Independence. So a, a, a clear and open discussion of founding documents can very much, in, they don't, it doesn't have to be all, oh, look how wonderful we are, right? A civics education can be very clear-eyed about how we have fallen short, right? Um, and that can be among, I think, the richest uh, uh, education when you can see that, um, that through the lens of those founding documents, we failed in some, res some important respect. What that tells us is that the project is not yet finished, right? And that when it certainly wasn't finished at the start of the American experiment, and it's been a long road and we're not done yet. Um, but every time we made a move in the right direction, it was because we were following the compass of liberalism. And those, those ideals are what are articulated in, in documents like the Bill of Rights and in the Declaration of, of Independence. Thank you. Um, do you see any connection between the decline in classical liberalism and in traditional religion in society? Oh, I wanna ask a, a follow-up question on, on that. So, so the question is, is there a decline in a, a coincidence between the decline in classical liberal ideas and the decline in religion? I'm I think wondering that's what, what they're asking. Yeah, yeah. And, and so um, I'm, I'm kind of hoping there might be another little follow up to maybe see like an example or something of what of what she or he is is um, is seeing. Um, not sure if we've got the capacity to ask for a little yeah, more. Yeah, well, but, but we, no. can, we can move on to another question. Oh, and then, um, and invite the question asker to maybe say a little bit more about what, what's behind the question. Oh, I have another person from another question from the same person. Um, um, 
which is from a policy perspective, do you think there might be value in a separation of state and economy similar to that between church and state? I don't know what that would look like. This is a person I need to have an actual conversation with, right? Because <laughs> it's clearly these provocative questions yeah, and I would love yeah. the give and take, but I don't know what that would look like. Yeah, um, and I don't uh, know how to interpret it. I, I, I too am intrigued by the possibility. So let me put it this way. The reason why I, I find it hard to parse that second question is because um, I see markets as really part of civil society. And so um, that, that, that to me is, says that, the, that there um, um, very much can be, you know, I, I think about um, uh, the, the work that so many of my friends do, they bring their religious principles into the job with them, whether their colleagues know it or not, they're living out their faith in, the, in their work. And I, I'm always inspired by that. I always think of that, and, and it doesn't mean that they're proselytizing or or that they're you know crossing boundaries in an unprofessional sort of way. It's more like I spent a lot of time doing this work, and if it didn't speak in some way to my spiritual commitments, I would find that somewhat hollow. And so you know, I, I I'm I like that there's lots of commingling of religion and economics in and in, in that spirit. Um, because uh, I, I don't think that we need to coordinate, coordinate off. Obviously, we need um, um, standards of professionalism and things like that, for sure. Um, but I think in people's hearts that um, they, they've got these big projects that they call their life. And um, the things that we find meaningful in one part of our life oftentimes get lived out in another part of our life. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to separate them out. Well, thank you. Um... We have a question. I'll, I'll ask an easy one, um, the, not the deepest of, of them all. Um, have you read the new book, Believe in People? And, uh, and, and do you see, how do you see that connected to your uh, comments today? Yeah, um, I have read uh, Believe in People. In fact, a shameless plug, I, I interviewed Brian Hooks who's um, the co-author of that book. And so you can, you can Google around and find, and find that um, interview. But um, the, uh, the book is by Charles Koch and, uh, and Brian Hooks and their, argue, and, their, and their point is that if we believe in people, if we, see, if we tackle social problems um, as if we understood that people are the solution, they're not the problem, right? We suddenly turn on its head most of the paradigms of, of, um, of philanthropic support, of, of, of um, um, trying to find solutions to uh, wicked problems within society. If we see people as the solution and not the problem, and we start to look for uh, solutions in the context of communities, that are solving those problems rather than imposing solutions from the top down, um, we find all sorts of new opportunities for creative solutions and, and, and lots of opportunities for experimentation. Some of the experiments fail. That's part of it, right? But that's also how we learn. And, and so I, I do believe that, and this is one of the reasons why going back to the first question about civics education, I'm a little challenged by it because it sounds... a if I were to say I want to articulate a civic code, it sounds a little bit like I want there to be a bunch of civics teachers pointing their fingers at us, you know, in school marm fashion and, um, and, and imposing something on us from the top down. And, I, and that I know is not going to work, right? If I... I wouldn't like it even if I thought it could work, but I know for sure it's not going to work. So instead, I am thinking much more of a bottom up kind of solution here. And in that respect, I do think of, of um, professors, teachers, writers, public intellectuals as part of a ecosystem of civil society. And, and so I don't see them as somehow elites off to the side imposing their highfalutin ideas on the rest of us. I think of them as being very much interconnected with, with all of us, all members of civil society. Um, and, and that's where we're gonna find the solutions. So um, I think that this, this call for a civic code that reanimates the principles of, of um, 
uh, liberal democratic society is very much in keeping with the Believe in People uh, book that um, Charles and Brian um, have written. Thank you. Um, uh, maybe you can respond to this comment from uh, Michaela Novak. It seems that an invocation of Smithian insights concerning sympathy and sympathetic exchange between diverse peoples will be critical to undergird your civic code. So a key aspect of Smith's moral system is putting oneself in another's shoes. And discursive strategies along these lines seem potentially very important to code building. Um, so how do we think about illiberal notions in that kind of context? Um, you know, um, to think, how illiberal notions affect people in the context of being trying to develop strategies to um, to see each other in each other's eyes or in each other's shoes. Wow, this is such it's a illiberal. great question. Yeah, yeah. And and hi, Michaela. It's uh, it's 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 great to hear your question, if not to see you. And I can't wait to uh, get back into seminar rooms uh, with you and and your colleagues uh, again. And um, as Michaela may know, uh, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments is is um, it's my it's in my top five uh, books of all time that I that I love the most. And uh, and she's exactly right to just give a little more context that. Um, where Smith's genius was is he built his whole moral theory, starting with this idea that that um, when we when we are naturally drawn, human beings are naturally drawn um, to care about other people, and we care about the sens sensibilities that others possess, and we kind of calibrate our um, our own moral disposition. Um, it as as we're developing it first by um, recognizing how our um, opinions, our actions, our, our, our moral uh, stances, how others react to it. And this is one, this is, and in that process, we're, we're sort of switching places and we look at our behavior from the vantage point of other people. And we learn from that and we recalibrate. And, and over time, we develop um, this sort of internal compass um, what uh, Smith calls the impartial spectator, um, who can look upon um, that he refers to it as the man within the breast, who, who looks upon our behavior and and um, without partiality, without give us, giving us any slack, in other words, um, and that's that's how we learn about um, what is right and what is the difference between doing what is right or praise um, worthy of praise and just wanting praise, right? It's 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 half it's it's only part of the system if we just learn how to calibrate our behavior so we get praise. That's not good enough. We need to calibrate our behavior so what we're doing is praiseworthy. So this is this is Smith's thing. So, um, so her question, Michaela's question, is then asking, well, how do we um, how do we encounter people who come into this into our orbit with illiberal perspectives? Um, and illiberal, um, illiberal intent and and um, uh, conditioning and attitudes. Uh, maybe it might be racist attitudes, for example. Right. Um, one of the things that um, is really a challenge in in this respect, especially if someone comes into a conversation with you where it's not it's disagreement at this deep kind of level, um, is to uh, take the time to try to understand where they're coming from. This is a very, very tall order and not all of us are up to it at any given moment of the day um, uh, or even in any given period of our lives. But um, one of the things that I think is, is um, really admirable is when people who have experienced the, the, um, um, the harsh realities of uh, illiberal, um, attitudes can find it within themselves to say, um, I'm going to listen to you. And now I want you to listen to me. Right. And so organizations like Braver Angels is, is a, is a good one in this respect, because it, it teaches us how to adopt that posture when it might be the last thing we want to do. 
Um, and to me, that's a deeply Smithian um, thing to do um, where you can um, uh, suspend your own suspend your, your, your own judgment long enough to actually engage with someone who disagrees with you um, on something important. Um, this can be an opportunity for moving towards a more just and more liberal society. And again, I wanna make sure that I'm not sounding as though I think that's easy or that all of us are up to that at every moment of our day or period of our lives. Um, but for those moments when we can um, see that sort of, um, we can create that kind of space for dialogue. I think it's, it's really pretty magical. Okay. Well, we, we, we have, I have several messages, um, questions that are sort of on the same theme of what you just said, but just for, for example, several basically ask the same kind of question that was just asked, but from the direction of religion as opposed to a, a sort of a Smithian framework. Sure. Um, and, but I, so I'm, I'm moving, I'm just gonna, because of time, I wanna move on to a couple other questions. So I'm trying to let people know that I'm not ignoring your questions, but I think that we've had a lot of conversation that relates to several of the questions that have been asked. And I thought I would try to get um, a slightly different um, direction. So uh, Zach German, um, who is one of my colleagues here in, at ASU, uh, asks, um, besides education, academic scholarship, uh, you know, what are the other ways that this culture and civic code could be cultivated? Um, he mentions Tocqueville, um, family life, we haven't talked about that yet, associational life as means to prepare citizens. It's not clear that these institutions play the kind of role that Tocqueville had in mind. Um, can we invigorate them? Um, are there other ways? What are we, you know, what are the other ways we're missing to foster such a culture other than some of these ones that we've already discussed um, that are uh, sort of more traditional sort of, we think of them quickly uh, like uh, religious beliefs, um, you know, the Bill of Rights, uh, et cetera. But so thinking in a Tocquevillian frame, where would we want to look um, in, in the modern world anew? Yeah, and, and I, it, we would be remiss if we didn't say something about, about um, uh, religious communities in this context, because I mean, clearly that's an, that's a, an intersection of civil society where um, we do transmit it. We're expected to transmit codes um, of conduct and behavior. And, and, uh, and I, and I, and I uh, would argue that um, the religious traditions that make space for toleration of, of other religions and other belief practices, not only the ones that are, you know, close to you, but maybe, um, you know, not just other denominations of the same religion, but other religions entirely, uh, to really think about um, how you can embed uh, a spirit of tolerance um, in into that into the community, one of the things that happens with toleration is that is that you start out by perhaps merely tolerating others, but but that creates enough space that then you could maybe perhaps get to know some people, right? Um, and that when you get to know actual human beings who practice that different faith, or you know perhaps um, you know believe in different um, political ends, um, the more you get to know them, even if even if you won't ever change your own mind about what your own beliefs are, you tend to demonize the other less, right? And so familiarity is a really important pathway that's created through toleration. And with more and more opportunities to connect to people, that toleration eventually builds into pluralism and a deep, deeper respect for the value of the diversity that's, that's brought in that. So I do think that um, houses of worship can play a really important role in um, connecting to uh, communities of faith that are very different and recognizing that, that um, there's nothing to be afraid of. And learning that lesson, I think, is, is really valuable because then it has positive spillover effects to other um, parts of life. Um, but, and don't undercut fa family either. Um, you know, yes, life is a little more complicated. Um, you know, we've got a, a lot more 
um, you know, meals eaten on the run rather than, uh, you know, right at 530 with everybody present at the same table. Um, it is true that it can be a little more challenging, but um, don't underestimate how much um, enculturation happens with in the family context. And, um, and that is an, it is another key nodal point of civil society where norms are transmitted. Um, I think that we can do a lot um, in just talking to kids uh, as if they're adults. Um, uh, as, as, you know, not, let me say it this way, talking to kids as if they are um, full-blown human beings, even if they're not adults yet. Um, and, um, and recognizing that they have moral commitments um, that might not be fully articulated yet, but they do have moral commitments. And, and rather than saying that that's the wrong um, moral commitment to have to get into the, the habit of, of drawing them out and trying to understand why they have those the moral commitments that they do and maybe push them and nudge them to, to um, think about those commitments in a systematic way. When, when, when parents do that for kids, that's more, that's a moral education. So, you know, let's not, you know, let's not be too dismissive of some of these, uh, these old standbys of religion and family. Um, but, I, but I will say that I think the workplace is an, is another one where um, the civic code can be very much um, a part of a work culture. And, and, and in a way that it, it um, because it doesn't require that we believe in the same things. You know, and that's, this is where religion can get tricky because, because with religion, there are certain beliefs that it are the sort of end state of the conversation that is the goal of the religious community is that everybody believes a certain set of things. And well, that's not necessarily the case in a work environment, right? That, um, that instead what you need are, are a common set of practices and principles by which you engage with one another. And that could be really empowering in terms of a civic code that, um, just drawing back on the very things we started out with, with respect and mutual respect and listening and humility. Um, that's a, those are important practices that can be fleshed out in a workplace environment as well. I just want to add, um, during this time of um, season of COVID, I have been wondering about the impact of um, social influencers and um, we think of them primarily as influencing us in the purchase of products, but I think they've actually done a, a quite a bit to knit people together um, in ways that um, that provide a kind of online way of doing some of the work that we can't do um, with. Do you have uh, an example in, in person? No, I, I don't want to launch into examples of. Uh, people, but many of them are people who are sharing their real lives, let's put it that way. People who are engaged, just they're just using the context of their real life to talk about the things that are happening around them. People who are COVID nurses, mm -hmm. people who are um, um, uh, critical to medical and um, emergency situations, talking about the challenges of doing that and the ways in which it, it, it happens, people providing information. So not necessarily the, the marketplace people as influencers, but the people who are using the social media. And we, we think of social media as a thin connection, uh, which is certainly true. Um, but I just, uh, I wonder um, if we uh, have overlooked some, sometimes the, the emerging technologies enabling us to uh, in this, even in this period of social isolation, in many ways, of being uh, of being knit together and finding ways of of communicating well um, with each other in ways that build a kind of uh, civic culture, um, and not just you know me and my isolated. You can think about. Yeah, that. I really like that point, Ross, and and I'm, and I won't remember her name, her her first name, her last name is Brown, but she's. One of the, uh, she's a YouTuber um, who's um, very very popular with um, particularly younger women, um, yeah. and because it's like she has this ability to sort of give you this virtual hug when you need it most, and and it's all very empowering messaging, and that that you have it within your capacity to to um, uh, work through trials and tribulations, 
And to me, I, I think of that as being, um, you know, the, the sort of thing that gets overlooked because we are concerned about, rightfully so, about vitriol and social media. We shouldn't overlook the fact that there's also um, opportunities to connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that connects to one of the questions that was asked, which was, how are we, can we be building our society when we have less use for religion and liberalism and, you know, and um, so, sometimes these, these things, we don't have to say, oh, I'm a liberal doing this, or I'm religious right. doing this. It just becomes uh, part of the way you do things. Um, so um, I, I'm just, we have very little time left, so I'm looking for new questions. Um, and um, um, one of the ones is about um, illiberal societies and um that these seem to be a uh, you know uh, illiberal today sort of like ethno nationalism um things like that um in say poland or hungary other places um you know they the the notion of being that we require particular um histories particular um, eth ethno, um uh, peoples religious beliefs, language, um, seems like this is a challenge to the kind of thing we're talking about because it does build, um, it, it builds a sense of community in some, some of the traditional senses, but not necessarily uh, the respect or the openness to others that uh, the, the kind of call of liberalism is to. And I wonder, um, if, do you see that as being um, a major challenge for us or for others in the world? Yeah, I, I, I think it's increasingly becoming a challenge for us. I think seeing the, um, uh, the hard right turn in some of, some of what had been uh, on the path of liberal de democratic societies um, it is troubling, but in particular is troubling that sort of, um, you know, we had really broken with the kind of uh, blood soil alter uh, notion right. of nationalism. We, um, it, we, we forged a concept of patriotism um, and what it meant and an American identity that didn't depend on, on that sort of blood soil altered um, nationalism. And that was, I don't know if it was unique in the world, but boy, is it special. And so if we, if we lose that, I, I think that that's um, a real concern. And this is where, this is why it's so important also in, in, um, in my work, I, I want to reach out to um, left of center liberals who um, still believe in the animating ethos of, you know, higher education, for example. And so we, we've got to work together to, to uh, you know, to provide the, the um, and shore up the foundation of the academy. Um, but at the same time, I also want to be reaching out to um, uh, right of center conservatives who really hold true to that value that um, any, anyone can be an American, right? Because the American identity is about the ideas. It's not about who your parents were and, um, or what religion you practice or, um, uh, you know, what your ethnicity is. And that notion of what it means to have a kind of identity as an American is so precious, but it is fragile. And there are elements on the right that are taking us, I think, in the wrong direction in this respect. And the people who have the greatest power to, to influence them, I think, are other conservatives. Other conservatives who will say, no, you've got the wrong idea of what, it, what American patriotism is all about. Um, and, and, and so finding ways helping you know that circle of scholars and public intellectuals articulate um, that notion of patriotism um, that that is dependent on ideas and the values that you have not dependent on who your parentage is um, that's a really important move for us and I think it's existential um, that we that we get this right that's a great uh, way to conclude our uh our session today, uh, we're leaving quite a few questions on the table. And so I hope I can uh, collect them and uh, I'll pass some of them on to you. That um, would be fantastic. Since I, since I know you uh, would appreciate seeing them. 
And to those whose questions uh, weren't addressed, um, I certainly um, um, hope that we can continue conversation. Um, a lot of the questions overlapped with others, so it wasn't always clear that you didn't actually address their questions. It was more yeah. uh, by the This is, a, this is a down payment. Hopefully we'll yeah, be, all exactly. be able to be in the same room at some time. We yeah, can actually well, have a be, real conversation. It would be great to have you actually here in Phoenix and area sometime and uh, to speak and, uh, and Just name it. the audience. Yeah, exactly. So we'll try. Um, awesome. Thank you very much, Emily, for your uh, time and energy and, and preparation. Look forward to seeing outcomes from this project in your writing, thank you. which uh, have always, um, I thought, been extremely good. And um, so thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate this opportunity, Ross.